Welcome to chapter 21, The American Empire. In this chapter, we're going to specifically discuss expansionism from the United States post-Civil War. So just a little background to get us started. Overseas expansion began in 1865, that's after the Civil War, because um, obviously with fighting here on our territory, right here in the United States, it was very hard to focus on expanding outward. We needed to settle that conflict here at home first. So as early as the mid 1850s though, Naval Commodore Matthew Perry and his squadron forced Japan to open its trade doors to the US and to other nations. So we had that interest before the Civil War, but the Civil War halted that expansionism. Then in 1865, President Franklin Pierce offered to buy Cuba from Spain for $130 million. That offer was declined, but it did show that the United States was interested in expanding, especially uh, to a, an area so close to us as Cuba. Foreign policy really began to expand under Secretary of State William Henry Seward. Seward was President Andrew Johnson's Secretary of State, and he took this approach to expansion from a practical and strategic side. First of all, practical, you know, he felt like specifically we needed to concentrate on areas close to us so we could protect our perimeter. But also the Civil War had convinced him that the United States needed naval bases around our perimeter to fend off any kind of future aggressor. He also had this romanticized view of expansion similar to Manifest Destiny that we saw in the 1840s. The next slide shows you an example of this romanticism. So here's a picture of Seward and this quote that was really unusual for him, a, a very practical man who showed his romanticized ideas of foreign expansion with a poem that he announced publicly. Our nation with united interest blessed, not content to pose shall sway the rest. Abroad our empire shall no limits know, but like the sea in boundless limits flow. Anyway, poetry always associated with romanticism, and here that's just a really good way to show his words and his own ideas of the romantic notion of U.S. expansion. So under Seward, several things began to develop. This foreign policy of the United States really took hold. He drove the French from Mexico. During the Civil War, when obviously our interests were internal, France had established a regime in Mexico under Archduke Maximilian of Austria. So this, according to Seward, was a clear challenge to the Monroe Doctrine that sought to limit European powers in the Western Hemisphere. So Seward told Napoleon that the U.S. would not stand for Maximilian's rule after the Civil War, where Maximilian was captured and executed by Mexican patriot leader Benito Juarez. Then Seward starts looking other places to expand. One of those places was Alaska, and his idea to expand to Alaska became known as Seward's Folly, simply because there were some people, some Americans, who thought it was absolutely ridiculous because they thought that the land was worthless. Alaska had been um, exploited by the Russian American Company for a number of years for its, for its furs and fur trade started to decline, so the company was headed for bankruptcy. Seeing this, and also fearing a war with Great Britain, Russia sold Alaska to the United States. Seward wanted it for a naval base and for a way to reach the Far East with markets like China. Knowing that he had to overcome the American uh, perception of this folly, as they've already started calling it, he started this marketing campaign to gain support for his plan. He told everyone about the vast natural resources that were just waiting in Alaska to be exploited by the Americans. He even compared it to the Louisiana Purchase, which had also been ridiculed at the time, but now was a rich part of the country. The Senate jumped on board pretty quickly. Some members of the House, though, were holdups, and um, they changed their minds, though, after the Russian minister gave them cash. So with that, Alaska became an American territory on October 18, 1867.
So for 20 years after Seward's retirement, focus changed back to the interior of the United States on farms and railroads and mines and factories and new cities and towns. They wanted to fill the United States area that we had with those things. But they knew that a stronger Navy would be important. And in 1890, the United States started working toward that stronger Navy. There were 1,900 vessels in 1880. Only 48 of those Navy vessels could shoot a gun. In 1883, they added four new steel ships, warships, so they could shoot. And then by 1890, they started building that high seas fleet that the Navy would become known for. Also, another Secretary of State that had a role in our expansion was Jingo Jim Blaine. He was Secretary of State under both President Garfield and President Harrison, and he advocated for Pan-Americanism. He felt like the United States owed it to Latin America to be kind of a big brother, not the negative big brother that we think about these days, you know, with all of our technology and stuff, but a big brother, someone to guide Latin America. And in 1889, he established a conference of Latin American leaders, and that conference led to the Pan American Union, which advanced cooperation throughout this hemisphere. Also, in terms of overseas expansion, we have a historian who jumps on board, Frederick Jackson Turner. He said that the frontier experience was not over for, for the Americans and that Americans really needed to find new frontiers. Reverend Josiah Strong is the one who specified that Americans needed to expand overseas. And as far as foreign policy goes, uh, there were some elite people dealing with foreign policy, a small group was concerned with politics. They were very influential in public opinion, but also the middle class support of expansion was very helpful. We have a more literate middle class growing in the United States, and those people are reading and they're making these decisions for themselves as well, that from their middle class stance, as well as from the upper class stance, that they're supporting expansion. Hawaii is one of those areas that was considered for expansion. We had American missionaries who went to Hawaii for mission work, but when they got there, they started a sugar industry and it became really more about sugar production than about missionary work. And in 1875, Hawaii was allowed to sell duty-free, so import tax-free, to the United States, and they became dependent financially and economically on that American sugar market. But in 1890, the Kinley Tariff removed fees for all sugar, which really hurt Hawaii. At about the same time, Queen Lily Kulani succeeded her brother on the throne. She wanted to restore Hawaii's culture. When her brother was on the throne, he basically gave away the power to those American advisors who were there pretty much to get rich on the sugar industry that they started. Americans in Hawaii formed the Committee of Safety and they overthrew the Hawaiian government. President Harrison very quickly signed an annexation treaty with the rebel government, but President Cleveland was inaugurated before the Senate could vote on it. Cleveland was opposed to annexing Hawaii and he sent people there to explore what happened and he found out that Americans overthrew the Queen and that the Hawaiian people did not favor annexation. He actually considered restoring the Queen to power, but when she said that she would decapitate all of the revolutionaries who had ousted her, Cleveland did not restore her to rule for their protection. So eventually annexation occurred in 1898 after President Cleveland left office. And here's a picture of the Queen, Queen Lily Kalani. Now let's move on to Venezuela. The United States was more aggressive here than they had been in Hawaii. And in 1895, they denounced the British claims to Venezuela. Secretary of State Richard Olney surprised the Brits with his blunt declaration of American power through the Monroe Doctrine. He demanded that Britain enter arbitration with Venezuela with the U.S. facilitating. But the Prime Minister of Great Britain rejected that 
and he was offended by the demand. So President Cleveland threatened military force and Congress backed him on that. Britain, seeing that, realized they had other problems too. Germany's challenge to its navy was becoming a problem. They were having problems in South Africa. So they just agreed to this arbitration to avoid war with Venezuela and the United States. In Cleveland's second term from 1893 to 1897, we see a more expansionist attitude begin. There's revolution in Cuba. Cuba revolted against Spain and asked the United States for help. The United States was sympathetic to Cuba. The colonies had been ruled by the British like they were ruled by Spain. And quite honestly, the United States had economic interest with Cuba as well. So when McKinley begins his term in March 1897, he is reluctant to enter into war because prosperity is starting to return to the United States doesn't want to do anything to ruin that at this point. But the sinking of the Maine made war unavoidable. Now, the sinking of the Maine is actually still very controversial today. Did Spain sink our battleship or did it explode on the inside? Was it an external explosion or an internal explosion? And that's something still debated. And this is an artist rendition of the destruction of the battleship, the main. And you can see the people flying into the air and um, they're in the water floating, trying to swim away. The Spanish-American War that started with the sinking of the main, whatever its reason for sinking was, was very quick. The U.S. overtook Spain and Cuba. Cuba gained its independence and the U.S. took Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. We have anti-imperialists who want to see the U.S. not colonize the Philippines. And they think that it's morally wrong for the United States to take over these colonies. Some others thought that these people were savages and they didn't want them as part of the United States. Ratification of the Treaty of Paris settled this issue and uh, the treaty between Spain and the U.S. was ratified 57 to 27, which was just one more vote than needed to ratify that treaty. So in terms of relations with Latin America, we leave a legacy of resentment. They insisted that U.S. economic interests came first, and Theodore Roosevelt really believed that the United States needed a passage to connect the Atlantic and Pacific, which would, in effect, be an economic interest for the United States. The United States sent troops to back the Panamanians in their attempt to overthrow their Colombian government. Shortly after Panama got its freedom, it issued land for the U.S. or it. Shortly after Panama got its freedom, it issued land for the Panama Canal to the U.S. And this image shows a picture of the Panama Canal. In terms of China, the United States didn't really push very much there. They just waited for China to become an open market. The Chinese didn't really want American imports. They also couldn't afford them. But the United States sympathized with China after they lost to the Japanese in the first Sino-Japanese War from 1894 to 1895. The U.S. just really wanted to protect its opportunity for trade. That's a wrap on Chapter 21. Don't forget to watch the Adam Ruins Everything segment that I've prepared for you as well.